shall we start ready okay. please present good evening everybody uh, my patient i am 6 years male child born out of non consanguineous marriage fifth by birth order hailing from jaunpur up and resident of dharabi khan by community and muslim by religion brought by an informed by mother uh, with chief complaint of abdominal distension since 3 years and swelling of feet since 1 year child was uh, apparently well child was apparently well 3 years back when mother noticed a uh, gradual distension of abdomen painless progressive initially in involving the upper part of the abdomen and later becoming generalized to involving to involve the entire abdomen swelling of abdomen <coughs> was associated with swelling of feet since last one year and which was on and off and which increased on walking and decreased on lying down there is no history of any decreased urine output or swelling around eyes no history of breathlessness on exertion or palpitation no history of prolonged passage of bulky offensive blue stools or vomiting there is also no history of yellowish discoloration of skin or mucous membrane or passage of high colored urine or clay colored stools there uh, no history of vomiting of blood or black passage of black stools no history of any uh, prolonged bleeding or bruising at any side or any history of on any altered sensorium and there is no history of any decreased appetite or any cox or cox contact regarding the past history there is history of multiple episodes of admission in private hospitals at uttar pradesh in view of swelling of abdomen for which parents had seeked treatment and on enquiry mother had said that the swelling of abdomen had decreased on giving some oral medication associated with increased urine output at that time birth history anc was registered mother immunized and investigated baby was delivered at hospital full term normal vaginal delivery cried immediately after birth there was no perinatal complication there is no history of any umbilical catheterization immunization history received only bcg opv and hepatitis b birth dose developmental history uh, child was child had achieved all uh, developmental milestones at appropriate age and presently was enrolled in school one year back but uh, discontinued school in in view of sick health dietary history diet was uh, is mixed diet child consumes fish once a week and diet is deficient in protein by 4 grams and by calories of 100 kilocalories regarding the fa- family history father is 40 year old uh, <coughs> literate studied only up till uh, 8 standard taxi driver by occupation earning up to 3000 per month mother being 30 years old studied up to 7th standard and being homemaker child is fifth by birth order and the youngest the eldest being 13 years so regarding the socio economic history the family lives in a kachcha house no uh, washroom or toilet facilities available seven people living in a single room with one window and one door uh, belongs to lower socio economic class according to kuppu swami scale okay so let's start analyzing so i think the first complaint is abdominal distension over 3 years yeah right for a in a 6 year old child okay so let's take that and think what we can think who wants to take that up we have done this some time in the past so general approach to abdominal distension anybody so in this case there is a history of distension abdominal distension for last 3 years so abdominal distension could be because of fluid collection or because of organomegaly as mentioned in the history there is a improvement after medication and there is a hospitalization for several times for the same complaint so in this case it looks like fluid collection okay so before we discuss whether it is fluid or not what about can you in one line rule out the other causes of abdominal distension 
why not flatus why not gaseous distension why not a tumor why only organomegaly why not fat so in one line if you can dis- rule that out then we can go ahead anybody you can rule it out why not gaseous distension sir it would be uh, abdomen distension will be decreased after passage of loose stu- after passage of stools very good so gaseous distension is waxing and waning so this is this has never subsided completely so that's ruled out okay fat is again because the child would be visibly fat that would be a complaint so that is ruled out okay now why fluid so fluid means you think this is something like nephrotic syndrome so everyone agrees anyone disagrees anyone has is uncomfortable can it be nephrotic syndrome yes yes it could be yeah it could be but anything any points against there is no facial puffiness so have you directly asked whether there was any facial puffiness at any time yeah i had asked that in morning whether at any time in the last 3 years there is no history of any facial puffiness okay so basically it's not facial puffiness which is important but you have to establish the generalized nature of the edema or the swelling so if there is if swelling has always been restricted to abdomen and lower limbs and never anywhere else in the body in the last 3 years then it doesn't fit into generalized edema right so by that virtue at least nephrotic is out so now how will you discuss uh, say organomegaly versus tumor or a mass versus fluid versus a combination of them yes sir organomegaly will come as the upper abdominal distension first okay. and uh, fluid if it is present then it will be generalized in this case it was upper first followed by generalized so organomegaly followed by ascetic fluid is the possibility okay so that's one possibility any other thoughts on that can it be only fluid so say can it be something like a peritoneal disease causing ascites there would be associated pain abdomen and uh, child will be sick basically if there is peritonitis peritoneal involvement okay so some peritonitis yeah the child will be sick what is most important is for 3 years you can't have peritonitis okay so just fluid for due to a local cause 3 years like peritonitis is out but can there be any other thing which can just linger for 3 years which can simulate fluid what can simulate ascitic fluid something in the abdomen which can be of a benign nature and which can just go on and on very good cyst what kind of a cyst mesenteric cyst so can it be a mesenteric cyst mesenteric cyst is localized so it's huge it's a big cyst that's why generalized abdominal distension and now the cyst is causing compression over ivc that's why bilateral lower limb edema but then it won't subside with any medication so this the abdominal distension has subsided with medication uh, and it was associated with increased urinary output at that time okay very good so if abdominal distension has reduced with treatment then it's medical treatment then it's unlikely to be a cyst okay so one thing we said was organomegaly followed by a fluid as she said so which organomegaly liver spleen kidney any other can be hepatosplenomegaly or any uh, renal mass hepatosplenomegaly or renal mass causing okay so out of these which one will you choose so hepatomegaly alone splenomegaly alone hepatosplenomegaly and renal four options 
So choose or put most likely. Think and choose. There is a logical reason behind it. Yeah? Anybody? You tell us. Sir, uh, hepatomegaly mainly will involve the upper part of the abdomen. Uh, hepatomegaly will uh, more, uh, cause more distension of the upper part than splenomegaly. Okay. So, what she is trying to say is that between hepato and splenomegaly, it is always hepatomegaly which causes abdominal distension because liver is a more superficial organ and a larger organ compared to spleen. A big part of the spleen is under the costal margin. So, splenomegaly doesn't give rise to abdominal distension so much as it gives rise to a lump in abdomen. Okay. So, that means hepatomegaly has to be there with or without splenomegaly. That is what is there. Splenomegaly will basically present as a lump in abdomen Correct. and uh, hepatosplenomegaly it will be generalized. Okay. What about okay. kidneys? She said, yeah, it could be a kidney mass. So, do you agree? It will come as an abdominal mass rather than abdominal Very good. Distance. So, kidney being a posterior organ, it will have to be huge in size before it comes as abdominal distension. So, actually it will be more like a lump. Okay. So, we seem to think that this is hepatomegaly likely plus minus splenomegaly and then as you said later it in became generalized so maybe there is fluid. So, now what? That is the anatomy. Now, within the liver, what is the problem? So, it, is it a chronic liver disease? Is it cirrhosis of liver? What kind of a problem is it? So, within the liver, let us try to further get the anatomy. So, for us clinicians, how would you divide the liver functionally? Into which parts? Synthetic and excretory functions. Okay, that is one way. Second, Sorry. anatomically, if you have to decide which part of the liver is diseased anatomically. So, then... Anatomically, sir, uh, whether uh, sinusoids involved, whether uh, uh, then uh, biliary system involved or whether hepatocytes involved. Very good. So, hepatocytes are involved or no. So, that is one part, hepatocyte. Second, when he says sinusoids, what he means is the vasculature of the liver. Third is biliary tract. And fourth is one more part. Kupfer cells, so which is reticuloendothelial system. So, you have to decide between these four which is likely to be involved in this child. So, now start thinking. Which do you think is likely to be involved? So, take hepatocyte first. So, this could be hepatocyte disease. Yes or no? If yes, why? If no, why? If it is a hepatocyte injury, there might be ictrus, uh, which is not uh, So, first thing she is saying, there is no ictrus, no history of any ictrus any time. Now, that is not absolutely against, but yet a strong point against. But in a three-year story, you expected at least some time. Okay, but maybe the child is compensated. Maybe his function is not yet decompensated. So, any argument against that? When I am saying an explanation for no ictrus, I am giving an explanation that maybe his liver function is not very bad. So, can you rule that out immediately? Edema of it is there, though synthetic function has uh, been hampered now. Albumin protein synthesis is less. Very good. So, she is saying that since there is edema, since there is distant fluid in the abdomen, it cannot happen without liver function having gone down. So, the two statements do not go hand in hand that liver function is preserved and yet you have in a hepatocyte disease. So, therefore, that is one point. Anything else? Besides jaundice? Uh, liver cell failures. Any sign, uh, signs of liver cell failure? Yeah, so what do you think from the history? What do you want to know? What have you got to know? Pamar eridima. No, on no, history. History, history, okay. 
we are discussing whether this could be hepatocyte disease so we want to know from history what else can we gather which will tell us for or against hepatocyte disease malina history of malina okay. um, so varicell bleed encephalopathy sensorium altered sensorium encephalopathy will of course be end stage but varicell bleed and malina so we are looking for signs of portal hypertension okay which could be secondary to liver disease so that's not there but that again is not a absolute point against it being a hepatocyte disease so the child could be having hepatocyte disease with portal hypertension who has not yet bled and will bleed okay so that's one what else any other reasons or how will you generally decide a chronic liver disease on history besides what you have said what loss what do you ask loss prolong loss of weight and loss of appetite okay so is it there in this child no so specifically did you ask that this child is a loss very of appetite is not there and he is normally happy and playful but uh, weight here is slightly misguiding because that distension is there since last 3 years we can't comment upon the weight okay but you have confirmed that the child is playful and happy and uh, but he doesn't go to school at home he is normal okay. he's not sick okay so if the history is accurate then that is again a point against hepatocyte disease okay now come to the next uh, part can is it biliary tract disease could it be biliary tract disease come on quick this is easy what is the first symptom of a biliary tract disease uh, sir there is no high colored urine exactly there, there has to be jaundice so there is no biliary tract disease so that's out third is reticular endothelial system So could it be reticular endothelial system? Hepatosplenomegaly due to a reticular endothelial system enlargement. Possible, right? Yes or no? So then, what is the cause of that? Why reticular endothelial enlargement? And what what is it that doesn't fit into reticular endothelial? how will you clinically make out reticular endothelial disease from other disease what is the difference between say hepatosplenomegaly due to reticular endothelial hyperplasia and hepatosplenomegaly due to say liver disease with portal hypertension what is the big difference is on examination consists history examination will come to pancytopenia pan okay pancytopenia again on in investigation give me an example of reticular endothelial hepatosplenomegaly malignancy 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 okay uh, so malignancy what will happen malignancy is a short story no a uh, such a such a long story three year story give me an example storage disorder you agree so now tell me what are the differences in history of a storage disorder versus a liver disease with portal hypertension both having hepatosplenomegaly the developmental delay may be there if the storage is in other organs what else dysmorphic features may be there what else some dietary restriction histories okay so let me ask pointed questions will the storage disorder come with edema fit no why not you're right now tell me why why not Why is the liver disease fellow coming with edema fit? Synthetic function is affected. So in storage disorders is function of the hepatocyte affected is the question. 
sorry very good so the biggest difference between reticulo endothelial disease and hepatocyte disease would be that hepatocyte function is preserved till late in the disease in reticulo endothelial disease whereas in hepatocyte disease obviously it is affected so you will not get jaundice you will not get edema fit you will not get any ill effect of the hepatocyte disease you will just get physical enlargement of the organ okay so that's what we think of as reticulo endothelial affection so in this child either we are suspecting fluid in the abdomen or we are anyway there's history of edema fit which would not fit into a storage disorder straight away but suppose it's a long standing storage disorder something like a gaucher's which has gone on for a long time then eventually whether liver cell will be affected and whether you can get edema it's a matter of debate over how long okay but initially no right okay which is the last part of our uh, anatomy of the liver Sin vascular so sinusoid you said so can it be a vascular disease which which is a vascular by vascular disease what do we mean portal hypertension due to uh, cirrhosis of portal that is cirrhosis is hepatocyte disease no sinusoidal or uh, post sinusoidal okay so can we can we just revise and explain what is pre sinusoidal and what is post sinusoidal so where is the sinusoid and pre means on which side of the sinusoid portal vein side is pre sinusoid say that again on the portal vein side will be pre sinusoid sinusoidal is hepatocytes and post will be like ivc in but chair is hepatocytes so towards the heart is towards post heart. sinusoidal and pre sinusoidal is towards the intestines towards intestine right so what is the difference between pre sinusoidal portal hypertension and post sinusoidal in pre sinusoidal uh, liver may not be affected also very good so in, it is not affected except for some rare varieties that we'll discuss so it is not affected very good what else so since liver is not affected what is not never there cirrhosis obviously so what what symptoms are never there ascites is not there edema fit is not there jaundice is not there speak loudly into the mic yeah the mic is getting out there please hold the mic close to your mouth okay speak only in the mic so since so that's pre sinusoidal what about post sinusoidal what happens in post sinusoidal where is the problem hepatic vein mic take take the mic sorry hepatic vein and ivc okay what is the problem obstruction thrombus, okay obstruction. so what happens so what will be the history or what will be the clinical features patient will uh, present with distension of abdomen because of ascites and and uh, will there be hepatomegaly or there will not be hepatomegaly will be present hepatomegaly will be there so hepatomegaly and ascites so now tell me this ascites is because of the liver being diseased that is the hepatocytes being diseased or some other reason congestion, congestion. because of the back uh, back pressure congestion so venous back pressure rather than hepatocytes so again there is no synthetic problem there is no hypoalbuminemia but it's a venous back pressure so can this be that can it be a venous system disease where the liver is enlarged there's free fluid ascites and there's even edema fit because of that can this be that yeah so it can be yeah so this is how we have tried to analyze which of the different anatomies of the liver could possibly be the problem here okay any other thoughts so uh firstly general dis generalized distension of abdomen we need to know 
it's over three years. So wanted to know how the course was. Initially, this was a significant distension, and there has not been much distension thereafter, or there has not been much distension. Sir, you here. were about a minute late. So she did say that it started with uh, upper abdominal distension. Then now, uh, in a short time, it became generalized abdominal distension, progressive in the initial phases, and uh, last one year there has been edema fit. Okay, so. I mean that helps us to distinguish, and also, is it more or less stationary for last one year? That's one thing. On As treatment, we she said, there is minimal, minimal decrease. After taking diuretics, it goes down. Also, I mean, when we were discussing fluid and feces, and one may keep in mind just a gaseous distension, not necessarily due to constipation, but due to malabsorption. Because children with malabsorption can present just with poor health and distension of abdomen which may not be progressively increasing so much in time, but the initial parental complaint may be abdominal distension. Coupled with that, of course, the generalized uh, uh, health of the child will go down. So in gaseous, often we often tend to think of only constipation, but distension can be secondary to malabsorption also. Then you said about fluid, and here, when the child was given diarrhea, the distension went down, etc. So, obviously, there was fluid there, and as we discussed that it could be a primary hepatocytes. I think coming in then always in the end, when there is hepatos or progress in distension of abdomen, which we think as hepatosplenomegaly and fluid, the closest differential diagnosis is always going to be between hepatocyte disease and pre -sinusoid. They will always be post very sinus close post sinus. They will always be running relatively close to each other because in one the hepatocyte disease is earlier and another the hepatocyte disease is little later and in one the ascite is a little earlier. And so that distinguish, distinguishing characters when, happens when you are not seeing the child and mainly on the history and this particular. Also we wanted to know whether this child has been doing well all along. That's what I asked her yeah. sir. So because she says hepatocyte disease over a long time. It appears that this particular child started with some organomegaly and now this particular child has So, gone. there is a bit of a contradiction in that. On one hand, she said child is active and playful as that's what the history she got. But on the other hand, because of his sickness in inverted commas, he has not been going to school. So, that we, we, we are little not also clear on that. Also, as we discussed regarding fluid in the abdomen, we considered the cyst and we considered cyst of the mesentery or something. Pancreatic cyst, pseudocyst of pancreas also to be kept in mind, can present as upper abdominal distension, relatively uncommon, therefore often forgotten. In a female child, rare possibility of ovarian cyst. So when we consider fluid, we can consider free fluid and encysted fluid, like we do in examination of a child. The only thing and is pancreatic yeah. will be very sick child and over a period of time. Over a, I mean, child will not also the after giving diuretic, the abdominal will not come on. And when we discuss edema, then we often say generalized edema make kidney disease. Let us reach kidney disease through one step. Generalized edema means hypoalbuminemia. And hypoalbuminemia is often due to nephrotic syndrome in the kidney disease, but a rare possibility of protein losing entropathy also. That means the patient is hypoalbuminic either because the synthetic function is deranged or the proteins are lost. If the proteins are not lost in the kidney, then they are being lost in gut. And therefore, there may be no kidney disease and therefore he may lose it. In. So, these differentials we will have to keep in mind. But I think over a period of time when similar cases occur, ultimately we have to make a distinction between primary liver disease going in for uh, liver cell failure and primary uh, disease of post sinusoidal obstruction giving rise to ascites. Because ascites and organomegaly seems to be common. I think two comments. One is that this child starts with a abdominal distension, so starts with hepatomegaly. Now, there is no question that this is not hepatitis when it started. Because hepatitis, if it started, had a jaundice, it had many other symptoms. So, this child starts apparently with just a liver enlargement without a hepatocyte dysfunction. So, this is not hepatitis. If this is not hepatitis, there is no question of cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is a chronic liver disease. And why does it occur? There has to be a predisposing cause. A predisposing cause could be a toxin, could be an infection. But there has to be a predisposing cause. So that predisposing cause would have shown as a liver disease and thereafter become cirrhosis. 
whereas this child apparently starts almost with upper abdominal distension without a hepatocyte dysfunction. And therefore I thought that this child had never had hepatocyte dysfunction. Now it has gone on for three years. Now which cirrhosis in children go on for three years? Adult cirrhosis can go on for a long time. In children, they once start decompensating, they go down fast. No child with a cirrhosis at three years, presents at six years, even now reasonably compensated or just getting decompensated. So to that extent, I don't think this is a hepatocyte disease at all. If the history is right, this is not hepatocyte disease. Then the next is, you said this child is reasonably all right. Not going to school, maybe because of he has got a huge abdomen, okay, and many reasons not going to school. It doesn't mean he's sick. So the question would be, is he playful, is he otherwise active? Now, many won't go to school, at the school time they are sick, thereafter they are all right, which means that they are okay. So I think largely, if I go by the story, hepatocyte disease looks very unlikely. Okay. Therefore, it has to be a venous obstruction and a post-sinusoidal obstruction. A post-sinusoidal obstruction child can go on for a long time and there is a wide spectrum of presentation. One presentation in infant could be a sudden appearance of ascites and a liver. That in a short time, in a week's time, two weeks time, child comes with a hepatomegaly and ascites. That obstruction is very severe in an infant and suddenly causes uh, hepatomegaly and ascites. On the other hand, in a little older child, slowly developing venous obstruction can initially cause just hepatomegaly. As the obstruction goes on increasing, there is more and more back pressure, liver goes on enlarging, thereafter ascites comes and the whole story progresses, thereafter even into a hepatocyte dysfunction. So, this probably fits in more of that. And to that extent, one would say that uh, two things are important to make a mention. One, how well the child was prior to all this. Are we missing out a hepatocyte disease which came and went, was not, uh, parents were not aware? Could it have been, uh, for example, a hepatitis without jaundice, an icteric hepatitis? So what was the past story like? Always start with the history that he was all right before the onset of this disease. Unless we know for sure whether he was all right. By all right we mean not asymptomatic only, but also doing well in terms of well-being, in terms of growth, etc. If we are sure of that, then there is no hepatitis at all. So that is one. Second is, what is the progression? By progression we mean a rate of progression. This child does not seem to have progressed much. Well, he came out with an ascites. Then he came out with an edema, but the progression is so slow. It also tells you that the progression is slow, is very unlikely a hepatocyte disease going down. So many such small things might make us say that it's likely to be a post-sinusoidal portal hypertension rather than a primary hepatocyte disease. But what we are aiming at at this point of time is that you need to get into all those details to be sure that it's not a hepatocyte disease. And I think, unless you start thinking what it could be, and you thought this could be one of the two, your question should further be asked in terms of what could it be. Let's go back and say at three years he presents with so-called hepatocyte disease. What hepatocyte disease comes at three years of age? Have you given a thought to that? Could it be viral A? Could it be B, C, D, E, etc.? Well, anything can happen any time. That's a different story. But most of the common viral AE, etc. are often asymptomatic, subclinical. They don't go into any complication. Does BNC present like this? Very unlikely. So, is that is so? Then, is there a history of a possible BNC? What is history of possible BNC? Okay, what's the family history? Has the mother been an ostrich and carrier? Did this child got a hepatitis B vaccine? Did this child got a blood transfusion? That means I need to look at, is there a possibility of a hepatocyte disease? And if not, then we are building up the whole story like that. I would say that would be the way to go. 
सर इम्यूनोलॉजिकल हेपैटो वेन वी एंटरटेन प्राइमरी हेपैटोसाइट डिजीज इन इन्फेक्शन वी वी नो दैट हेपेटाइटिस ए यूजली नैन इनोसेंट इज ए नॉट कॉज ऑफ प्रोग्रेसिव लिवर डिजीज बी एंड सी ऑलवेज टू बी केप्ट इन माइंड एंड वी ऑल्सो से मेटाबॉलिक एंड इम्यूनोलॉजिकल नाउ डू इम्यूनोलॉजिकल डिजीजेस प्रेजेंट रिलेटिवली लेट इन लाइफ एंड हाउ डू दे प्रेजेंट एंड वी हार्डली सी देम और डायग्नोज देम एंड एन इम्यूनोलॉजिकल आई एम सॉरी मेटाबॉलिक लाइक विल्सन्स डज इट प्रेजेंट एज अर्ली विथ progressive hepatomegaly to which now the ascites is added i think immunological and metabolic disorders present as hepatitis like that means they present as jaundice not just a hepatomegaly look at the immune mediated hepatitis disease it's an autoimmune hepatitis so there is jaundice look at the metabolic liver disease jaundice okay be it a galactosemia glycogen storage tyrosinemia or a little later wilsons Yes, there is the Wilson's as a wide spectrum because it comes slowly over time. But look at the ones that come early: galactosemia, glycogen storage, fructosemia, tyrosinemia. Okay, as a modern, they will present as jaundice. That is one. They will go down fast. It's a metabolic disorder, and you have not taken care of any part of the treatment of that metabolic disorder because he is still feeding the same way. there is no other treatment so he will go down very fast to that extent those are unlikely infections as i said b and c for example if b and c is causing hepatitis again some time or another there is some jaundice it may not be a continuous process and if he is just a carrier then he has nothing he may be hepatitis b carrier and he doesn't have any even liver enlargement so carrier will not present a sufferer will present with jaundice because ultimately it's a hepatitis and even if it's a chronic hepatitis it is hepatitis so by being hepatitis you have symptoms of hepatitis it may be mild jaundice it may be waxing and waning jaundice but jaundice is a feature so i feel that by and large we can rule those out yeah? and can we give importance to chronology sir for example a hepatocyte disease giving rise to cirrhosis and ascites a sick child first and ascites developing later okay. and in uh, post sinusoidal a relatively normal child suddenly yeah. coming with ascites and hepatic diseases absolutely yeah. come we'll examine the child so who wants to volunteer now examination this one is easy Meanwhile, tell us what do you expect. Okay, let's do that exercise. Distension, distension of abdomen, abdomen and moderately nourished, um, non-sick looking. Pedal edema. child is um, alert and uh, uh, he is little anxious um, and uh, he uh, is nourishment wise uh, is because of the distension cannot comment and edema is there so nourishment we cannot say much and uh, on general examination head to toe um, 
uh, abdominal is grossly distended flanks are full umbilicus is stretched transverse uh, pedal edema is uh, the swelling of the both lower limbs pedal edema is present on palpation will be confirming it and uh, distension of uh, veins uh, more on the upper part of the abdomen and um, So clubbing, I will have to again confirm it, but looks little. There's mine. So when you talk of nourishment, you said because of edema you can't comment. So actually you can look at the face, you can look at both the upper limbs. So you can still comment on nourishment, yes. especially if you look at his face. He's quite comfortable, happy. His yes. cheeks Kabeer. are literally prominent. So that means the nutrition is. Fair, you know, it's not. So that's. Look at the subcutaneous tissue, the muscle mass. They will yes, give you the idea. The upper limbs are not edematous, yes, so sir. you can comment on. Yes. And we have made this point again and again about the veins. Yes, Please make a distinction between visible veins and dilated, tortuous veins. Okay, whenever the skin is stretched for any reason, veins are visible. That is. No significance as against dilated and tortuous veins. Yes. I think one can comment on the length or height as well. Okay. So there are many ways to say that this child is certainly not a sick looking and not a very much malnourished child. And this is in spite of three years of a disease. What does that tell you? That disease has had hardly any significant effect on the well being of the child. So your disease must be such that does not upset the well being. So each of these points would be very, very important, right? Yes, sir. And when you comment on the veins, you might like to turn the child around and see. Don't restrict only totally to the abdominal veins, but you need to look at the veins at the back also. Are there veins at the back? I saw you have a little When genitalia can be examined for scrotal edema. This is just to reiterate what Dr. Rajesh said last time regarding ascites. The distension, you know, my, note that in ascites, distension is so to say in all three directions. In this direction, in this direction and this is direction. While when there is no ascites, there may be distension only in this direction and the flanks, there is no distension. So here you can yes. easily see, see the, the flanks are bulging and this is also bulging. Yes, sir. What general examination, relevant findings you want to make a mention? So, in an exam, you must tell an examiner relevant negative findings. Liver cell failure features. Uh, uh, no ictrus. Uh, um, I'll have to check the oral mucosa also. Yeah, you, can, you can touch the child. Yes. Uh, no pallor, no ictrus. Uh, then... Uh, Pama Reridima, no Pama Reridima. Spider nearby. Extensor and shoulders. Spider nearby, we have to. Spider nearby, do we have to mention because mostly we find in adults. Adolescents. To estrogen. I think what you said is right. Few things are almost not seen in children. Okay, like say the flaps, like a fetal hepaticus. Now those are all adulting. And why are they not seen in children? Because it takes a long time of a slow progressive liver disease that comes with that. So slowly progressive chronic liver disease presents with those things. In children many times the disease starts decompensating, it goes fast into an encephalopathy or a liver cell failure. Whereas in an adult very slowly. That's why just the flapping tremors, the fetal hepaticus, all that is Gyne not seen. Gynecomastia, gynecomastia never or seen. testicular <laughs> atrophy. But don't mention that in pediatric practice, right? Yeah. So I'll check the genetic. Yeah. Would, you, would you also mention about clubbing and cyanosis in the liver disease? Would you like to mention? Clubbing and cyanosis in the liver disease. 
clubbing for clubbing for uh, bilary cirrhosis clubbing, clubbing for bilary cirrhosis okay bilary cirrhosis mm. only bilary cirrhosis okay yes even a sinusis occasion okay you have a porto pulmonary syndrome okay we are not really it's it's not important what i am trying to say is that if you say no clubbing no sinusis in one breath it will be good i'll ask you why did you mention it it's certainly not common but even as clubbing clubbing is seen not only in a biliary cirrhosis but in any chronic disease even a chronic intestinal disease may have clubbing okay not a significant drumstick etc that's only in a cardiac or maybe in a respiratory so that may be important to go by right sir i thought sinusis was an important thing because you can get porto coronary and the sinusis is something which you have to really look very carefully it's not a sinusis of a sinotic heart disease it will be so subtle that you will easily miss it okay so you have to look astutely for sinusis and you will also observe how she is palpating how she is percussing okay because the method of palpation percussion is also equally important so do it correctly first palpation first i'll try with the pumps and otherwise then dipping method whatever you do whatever you like they will all observe and then they will comment yeah good in an older child even start telling him what you are doing that's important or in a smaller child tell the mother what you are doing okay so tell them that nahi kuch nahi hoga dard nahi hoga aste se main dekhunga you know so he knows about it right yes Okay, all right. Will you do it? Let's see how you do it, and then you will all comment on what she did and what she is going to do. Palpation. First of all, superficial uh, palpation to see whether tenderness is there, and uh, if tenderness is there on any area, then we should palpate that. So just that do it. Less. See, most of us know what to do, but we don't know how to do. And, uh, so we are now testing how to do. no rebound tenderness now i will do deep palpation incidentally since you mentioned rebound tenderness first of all here may be there was no relevance of rebound see if there is tenderness then you look for rebound tenderness if there is no tenderness there is no question of rebound tenderness secondly since you mentioned you didn't check for rebound tenderness at all just now your maneuvers are not what is free so tell me how do you check for rebound tenderness so is rebound tenderness superficial palpation or is it deep so how do you do it imagine that you are looking for rebound tenderness in a child with acute appendicitis suspected imagine how will you do it when we leave our hand child should get pain so you palpate you press deep down you almost hold there for a few seconds and then release suddenly and he should wince with pain so that is rebound tenderness okay okay go ahead so starting with the right iliac fossa uh, with the uh, its uh, inspiration i will go up and i think you just do we will uh, we will all observe you
लेफ्ट लोक ऑफ द लिवर ऑल्सो इज पालपेबल एंड देन सर अपर मार्जिन विल बी इन परकशन सो आई विल पालपेट फॉर स्प्लीन स्प्लीन इज नॉट पल्पेबल देन परकशन फॉर द अपर बॉर्डर It is almost five fingers. Sir. Yeah, you should calculate which one. This is the angle of Louis. So below that second, third, fourth, fifth, fifth space from fourth space, past fifth space to here. Uh, so. Check the spleen. Left lateral position. Very Put in the left lateral and uh, give a thrust from the left hand and right hand. You can palpate so possibly. So first is when you start feeling for the spleen, when you reach the left costal margin and you haven't felt the spleen, first is to tell him to take a deep breath, because a just palpable spleen will pop out of the costal margin on a deep breath. So while you are feeling there, you say lumbar sans low, lumbar sans low. Then you can't. Then you turn him on left lateral. Then you say that no spleen is palpable. Okay. and this you have to calculate sir said space and you have to also measure the distance and then say liver span so now who will comment on what mistakes they did while palpate or they palpated well first thing is that never dig your fingers into abdomen you are you are all doing like this that is not the way to palpate a liver let the liver come to your fingers and you don't reach the liver so take a note of that i think everybody was almost doing this by doing this you are stopping the liver from coming to your hand so that is not the way to palpate and therefore superficial palpation is just touching okay and when you start a deep palpation your hand should not really poke the abdomen but just keep it this way and see whether the liver touches you and don't dip your fingers in the liver now this is where i start finding the liver but i'm just holding my hand and he is taking an inspiration and bringing down the liver to my finger but i don't reach my finger to the liver i think that yes. is the so what is the go. big difference when you were palpating only up to your first crease was in touch with the abdominal wall whereas when sir was palpating 60 to 70% of the palm is in touch with the abdominal wall that is the important difference okay and when you dig in fingers they often tend to keep the abdomen tight No, no. See, no, no. dipping deep, method is different. Dipping method is when you have ascites, then you go on dipping with that. There also you don't use it. We don't mean dipping method means it's not the finger tip. Finger tip is never used. Okay, for dipping method is when you have used ascites and then you want to freeze one. That's so, so like we said for the spleen, any child with ascites, you don't go for the dipping method. you first do your normal method if you haven't felt the liver at all and there is a huge ascites or it's a obese child then you before declaring that there is no liver palpable you may try the dipping method to see whether you have missed the liver because of the huge fluid or the huge fat okay so only in those cases here it is not necessary dipping method is not necessary in this child other thing is that when you have a large ascites you can turn the child on that side you're pushing the fluid there getting the air here now you possibly can palpate a liver better as much as you want to bring the spleen to your fingers by putting him on the right side you can also put the child on the left side to facilitate the palpation of the liver 
because after all you have a shifting fluid. So let the fluid go that side. Let therefore uh, there could be an easy approach through the gas onto the liver. So you can even turn the child on that side and facilitate your palpation of liver. So what are your findings on palpation? Also when you go for the spleen, the direction of the hand is very important. Okay. Just as you went over here, first of all as sir said, when you keep it flat, just a tip if you drop your shoulder, keep your if you drop your shoulders a bit, then you will be able to do this movement much better. If you are here, the tendency is to go toward, through your tips of the finger. When you are going for the spleen, just as you are moving this way, for the spleen, you are supposed to be going this way because you don't know where the tip of the spleen is. If you go, you are hunting. If you go along this line, then you will feel the spleen better. Okay? And also, if one of some of you, if you are following Hutchison, it will tell you the other method or of doing it this way. Okay, going for the spleen, uh, going for the liver in this manner. In most most cases in pediatrics, sir, we don't follow that. What their argument is that the rectus sheath, which is running here, if you go this way, sometimes you get confused between the two. So you go along this line. This is just to keep you posted. If somebody asks you, say that is an alternative way of checking. Also, when you do deep palpation, when it's an obese child, you want to use one hand and you use the other hand to press. Because as sir said, if you press with this hand, you are you're not feeling the sensation of the liver coming and touching you. So, use the other hand to dip it and then you will be able to feel it better. Okay, that's the double, double hand method to pick up a liver in the obese child. Thank you. Um, sir, uh, liver is uh, palpable uh, two centimeter, uh, two, three centimeter below the subcostal margin, and uh, it is uh, uh, smooth, um, uh, smooth ma uh, well, margin. You must comment on the anterity of liver. Liver okay. is palpable three centimeters in the right mid-clavicular plane, yeah, yes, the left sir. lobe, the everything, everything. Yes, right mid-clavicular line, and even uh, left lobe is uh, uh, palpable, sir. Um, just uh, two, uh, two to th three centimeter below the epigastric uh, region, and uh, smooth margin for forming consistency, uh, and uh, um, uh, border is a round, uh, rounded border, and um, um, surface is smooth, consistency form. Uh, when you touch uh, the liver, did you look anywhere else also? Pain. Uh, Hepatojugular reflex. Uh, a reflex or reflux? Reflex. Reflex. Okay. Ref uh, uh, when we press the liver, um, uh, usually there will be a um, uh, uh, flow in the jugular uh, vein. Uh, and uh, in the normal child, it will come down within uh, up to 3 centimeters, it will come down. But in case if there is any uh, obstruction or something, then it will persistently be high. And then it will take some time to come down. So. Anybody else? Anyone else? A little better description of what is hepatojugular reflux? Um. Yes? On palpation of the abdomen, on palpation of the abdomen in the normal individuals, there is slight rise in the uh, 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 J, uh, pulsations, uh, followed by sudden fall. While in cases of any congestive symptoms, there is sustained rise throughout uh, throughout the period of palpation. There is no fall in the pulsation. And? Um. Yeah, you're right. So basically, when you palpate on the liver and press on the liver, because it's so vascular a structure, you push a lot of venous blood into the right side of the heart ka system. Normal compliant system can absorb that sudden blood very easily. So there is a transient prominence of the neck veins which immediately settles down. So hepatojugular reflux is ill sustained or not sustained this is normal when the right ventric right atrium is not compliant when it's 
congested as you said or when it is overloaded or whatever right side then this extra venous blood cannot be accommodated so the vein becomes prominent and remains prominent as long as you press it this is sustained hepatojugular reflux which means there is a right sided failure and the third is when there is a block anywhere from the hepatic vein to the venous cava vena cava then there will be no reflux at all hepatojugular reflux absent that tells you that there is a obstruction okay almost like plantar can be flexor extensor or absent why should it be absent because you didn't do it well is that so peripheral neuropathy also so the sensation or even the motor the thumb cannot just the great toe cannot move what can you do so it could be absent also so hepatojugular reflux absent yeah. yes you mentioned about the liver okay then spleen not palpable and after that percussion percussion the more difficult part do it just do it we'll see So first she should demonstrate there only Normally you would have mapped out the areas which are dull right in the beginning when he is lying down and then you would have started moving the patient in either direction So, what have you shown? Uh, there is a fluid in the abdomen, and um, the shifting dullness is positive. Uh, that means more. So, what is shifting dullness a sign of? Free fluid. Free fluid in the abdomen. The free word is important. Okay. So, do you mean there is a hydroneumothorax, uh, like hydroneumoperitoneum? No, sir. Uh, Then, what is? what is shifting gas and fluid right yes um, so that is hydro but pneumo uh, peritoneum normal uh, near around the umbilical is a little bit of air uh, intestine so my question is that you have pleural effusion you have a pneumothorax you have a hydro pneumothorax which means both air and fluid so this peritoneum has air and fluid both right that's why shifting but there is not uh, if it is very tense ascites then it will be no. 
shifting what is shifting fluid and air, air no yes, so that means hydro pneumo peritoneum yes sir what sir is asking is that where you get the resonant note there is air right that air is where is it in the peritoneum intra abdominal there is pneumo in the intestine and in the bowel loops not in the peritoneum then why do you think the fluid is in the peritoneum Of course, how can, how can that be? I'm I'm just asking you, what is your reaction to that? Okay, so it's the intestines which are floating in the air. So when you shift the fluid, the intestines are floating up here. That is why you are percussing a tympanic note on the intestinal gas. Okay. So liver is about three centimeters firm. Left lobe is more prominent. Yeah. Please take a note of that. This liver is firm. Okay. And would you do a horseshoe shape dullness, or would you put him on the prone and see the dullness? What will sign? That's only for a small quantity, 50 uh, up to 50 ml only. And don't try even to do that. It is very theoretical. You do this maneuver, say yes or no. You don't have to do any other maneuvers. those who know ultrasound report might pick up such finding but otherwise no so we'll not worry about that small fluid fluid thrill we'll do it only there okay. fluid thrill yeah uh, we need for other person one more hand for uh, so you know that well can fluid thrill be absent in ascites can it be absent in ascites if it is um, very tense to it may be because dampening will be less so that is one extreme where there is extremely tense ascites it may be absent but actually when you can demonstrate shifting dullness you are unlikely to get a fluid, fluid thrill yes sir when fluid can be shifted then it is easy there is lot of movement possible yes. yeah so fluid thrill is between that shifting dullness stage and that extreme tense stage of ascites yes so less likely we'll get in this but should we demonstrate at the end you may get it on Don't be so soft. Yeah, okay. Sure. <laughs> yeah. We can tap it with that. Negative. Okay. So the vibrations I have not felt on the other side, so it's negative. In exam, you'll ask the examiner to keep his hand. So what do you do? Patient's hand. Or mother's hand. Or mother. Would you look for pleural effusion in this? would you look, look for it. would you look if so why and then look for it yes a basal uh, uh, lower uh, pleural effusion can be there if it why can. this we said there is no hepatocyte dysfunction no hypoalbuminemia so why do you expect a pleural effusion and do you think hypoalbuminemia causes a pleural effusion No, so because uh, now if you are considering post sinusoidal uh, uh, obstruction, then there may be uh, pleural effusion. If that uh, that is the reason, if not, uh, I'm just wanting to take a note that if you have a scientist and you don't know the cause, if you know it's a liver problem, yes, it's a different yes. story. Yes, Otherwise, there could be a polycerocytosis. Yes. So you want to pick up. Mm. You want to be sure that there is no other fluid collection. in a child like this when you are suspecting abdominal problem there may not be so but there could be a reason to anticipate that that right yes. yeah. no other findings right also oh, yeah. yeah also in a case like this you look at the heart very carefully yeah. because the child could have constrictive pericarditis and the jvp may not be so obviously seen and then you may have a some a rub or something there Obviously, pericardial effusion may not be there. Otherwise, the child will have a cardiac tamponade. But don't forget the veins and the heart. 
Child sitting comfortably, not sick looking, vitals uh, stable with pulse rate of 100 per minute, regular normal volume, um, peripheral pulses well felt with respiratory rate of 28 per minute, BP of 96 by 60 in left upper arm supine position. Regarding the head to toe examination, skull, spine, ear, nose, oral cavity all were normal, no evidence of icterus, petechi, pallor or ecchymosis, eyes. Uh, uh, neck, no palpable ne lymphadenopathy, neck, axilla and inguinal region, G uh, JVP not raised and no palmar erythema, no clubbing sinusis, genitalia normal, no scrotal edema and uh, lower limb there is uh, visible swelling but no pitting edema present. Cutting the anthro height is 97 cm, less than minus 3 standard deviation for height for age. Weight of 16.45 kg <coughs> between minus 2 and minus 1 standard deviation and uh, weight for height uh, between median and plus 1 standard deviation BMI of 17.48. Regarding the systemic examination inspection of abdomen. Is the child malnourished? No, only the only height weight uh, height for age is less than minus 3 but uh, he is stunted, right? Uh, yes. So, extreme malnutrition. Long standing malnutrition. Long standing. So, do you agree to that? Because the weight is. Uh, cannot be commented because of the ascites and edema uh, and height is less uh, so chronic um, so what would you want to call it chronic malnutrition what would you want to be affected to call it chronic malnutrition height, height. only height weight, weight for height and what is weight for height between median and minus plus so one Median to plus one. Okay. Yes, so weight for height is not affected at all. Even though you may doubt that weight is not affected because of ascites, but even then that weight is too good. No, it is in the normal range. So when and in a chronic malnutrition, weight and height both have to be affected, but which has to be affected more? The weight. Weight, weight, has, weight has to has be affected more than height. So that is why their be height only being affected, this is likely to be genetic rather than malnutrition. Okay, so this is how you interpret. Okay, this is not, and of course you can correlate clinically. Now we said na, upper limb and face is totally normal. So that tells you that that weight is not just spurious because of the ascites. He is actually not malnourished. Regarding the systemic examination, uh, inspection of the abdomen, uh, grossly distended, flanks full, umbilicus uh, displaced downwards, transverse stretched, no discharge, redness or any uh, sinus, movements of abdomen uniform all over the abdomen, no visible, uh, visible non-tortuous veins present, only over the upper part of the abdomen, no visible pulsation, scar marks or any obvious swelling, hernia sites were normal. Posterior abdominal wall, there was no dilated veins and no fullness of the renal angle. Palpation, uh, superficial palpation, uh, was soft and non-tender, no guarding or rigidity. The direction of flow of veins were away from the umbilicus and uh, there was uh, diverification of recti present. On deep palpation, palpation uh, liver was palpable 3 cm below the right subcostal margin in the right midclavicular line. 
firm in consistency uh, round bordered smooth surfaced and non tender left lobe was palpable 6 cm below the zipi sternum zipi sternum firm in consistency and liver span of 12 cm spleen was not palpable percussion uh, shifting dullness was present and there was no fluid thrill and uh, other regarding other systems respiratory system there were no crepes air and bilaterally equal uh, cvs is s1 s2 normal no murmur present and cns there were no it was normal so how will you summarize and what's your final diagnosis the 6 year old uh, male child uh, developmentally normal um, partially immunized presenting with uh, hepatomegaly and uh, hep uh, hep ascites since last 3 years and swelling of the foot uh, feet since last 1 year on a, with uh, examination findings revealing hepatomegaly with ascites with no uh, obvious signs of uh, decomposition of uh, chronic liver disease to rule out any uh, um, post sinusoidal cause uh, obstruction in the hepatic vein or ivc as the cause for ascites no doctor you just in the beginning summarized everything and then gave the diagnosis but you never gave any rational for having the diagnosis you just summarized that he has ascites and non immunized and partial immunized and all which meant nothing as far as the diagnosis was concerned and then you suddenly said that you want to but you never arrived at the diagnosis so means what sir is saying is you must use some adjectives to describe the whole story and then conclude that this means this this means this so my diagnosis is post sinusoidal obstruction you can uh, start that this particular child has significant ascites with hepatomegaly without much splenomegaly occurring over a period of 3 months or 3 years so you start like that and then come out with your plus points only there you don't have to mention partial immunized and this child was like that like you straight alight at the main point what are the salient features this particular has significant ascites significant hepatomegaly firm liver no splenomegaly no evidence of portal hypertension clinically so he has ascites and hepatomegaly over a period of 3 years gradually progress without any disturbance of hepatocyte function in an otherwise normal active playful child without affection of his growth okay so when you mention all this you say therefore i conclude that hepatocyte is normal therefore and like we discussed on history so and there's no jaundice so biliary tract is normal this is not reticular endothelial hyperplasia because spleen is not in, enlarged and plus there is free fluid so this is a vascular uh, involvement of the liver in the form of post sinusoidal obstruction here you have to take the history and the physical finding and start with this is a case of this when you want to give over to a next patient when you are, what we say that child with ascites and hepatomegaly don't you give that in one line so you start with that and then you give your analysis i think what you would have summarized is that this child has a chronic slowly progressive liver disease without any hepatocyte dysfunction but with presence of ascites suggestive of a venous obstruction post sinusoidal so that tells you everything chronic slowly progressive without any affection of the growth so i have already said that there is no dysfunction with ascites but without hepatocyte dysfunction that means i have ruled out hepatocyte in which condition of a liver disease you get ascites hepatocyte or the venous saying that there is no hepatocyte dysfunction therefore there is a this is a chronic slowly progressive venous obstruction which is post sinusoidal so i have given you anatomy and the pathology etiology diagnosis is not complete so chronic slowly progressive liver disease with ascites without liver dysfunction with no affection on growth therefore this child has got a post sinusoidal venous obstruction anatomy and pathology is clear etiology so you must talk also about the etiology 
possible etiology. You can't, you can't just palpate the liver and say etiology. But what could be a possible etiology? So, who would take a... There can be thrombus uh, blocking the uh, IVC or hepatic vein. Or there can be pr uh, pressure from... So now, you are giving me all causes. I want you to tell me what possible cause is likely in this child. You are right. Okay. Now argue, what, how far can you reach? I'm sure majority of the time, after investigation, we will not know. Good. If you don't know after investigation, what is wrong in making a guesswork without investigation? So how would you go by that? Coagulopathy can cause uh, thrombus formation. Okay. And therefore you would say that this vascular obstruction could be a thrombotic profile abnormality in this child. Yeah. Okay. It could be an antibody related apla. Yeah. Okay. However, there is no family history. There is no history of a previous any such vascular episodes. Therefore, clinically, I am not able to say what is the possible etiology. Now you have protein C, S, antithrombin 3, all that becomes only theoretical. But how would you pick up that family history or the previous episode somewhere else? And therefore we must ask the family history, did anybody in the family have had any vascular episodes? Okay, if he says yes, one's father had also some vascular episode, oh then it is a genetically determined disorder. That much you can go by, right? Fine. Uh, tell us investigations. As you have a mic, you go ahead. How will you investigate this? Sonography, USG abdomen, uh, especially uh, hepatic, uh, to view hepatic veins and IVC and uh, portal vein, uh, to locate the exact location of uh, this uh, blockade. Then... Uh, th uh, co to rule out coagulopathy, PT, INR, PT, uh, and, um, so PT, INR you are doing for what? To PT, INR is for synthetic function of the liver. So Leading to disorders, it is to be done. So, means you are, if you are trying to decide that hepatic function is normal and as part of that you are doing it's fine. But to find out what is the cause here, what would you like to do? Uh, coagulation profile, protein C, protein S, antithrombin 3, uh, antiphospholipid antibody. The INR research are not necessary. You can at the most say that I'll do HGPT bilirubin. That's enough. Okay. okay. When you talk about the PT, PTT, INR research, you are talking about liver cell failure. First, let me know whether it's a hepatocytis. So, if you said albumin, HGPT, bilirubin, I would accept that. When you talk about the rest of the investigation, there is always an issue to talk about. So, while you say, theoretically, I would be required to do all these tests. Okay. There would be an examiner who would say, is that possible in our country? Can you treat it? Why do you want to do it? There would be an examiner who said, how can you not do it? Okay. So the best way would be to say that one can further investigate the probable cause of a thrombosis. However, such tests are costly, not easily available. And even when you have a diagnosis, treatment is extremely costly and just not possible. Therefore, I would discuss with the parents and say that we could investigate, but even when we investigate, we may not find, and even if we find, we may not be able to treat. This is the right answer. The, both the types of examiners are satisfied. One who always wants and one who always does not want. So learn to do this, okay? Because it's useless. I'm sure none of us have seen such positive tests, and you know that it's only a millionaire in the U.S. who can afford protein C, etc. Not even millionaire in India, maybe. 
So, why are we discussing? But the best way is to do that. I will talk to the parents and tell them that these things can be done. However, there is a limitation of that. Would you do an APLA at least? So, what is APLA? Antiphospholipid antibody. So, what does it tell you? So, what is this APLA syndrome? Any one or two lines on that? Anybody? Uh, patient has a thrombotic uh, tendency and thrombosis can be anywhere and in the after puberty uh, recurrent abortions pregnancy loss uh, also can be there it is called lupus anticoagulant and it is a misnomer like uh, it is not a means patient is more prone for thrombotic events rather than anticoagulation also, it can be primary or secondary. So, more common is secondary to other disorders and not necessarily primary. So, basic illness is something else and it can also lead to secondary. Sir, may I attempt the uh, approach to diagnosis once? <coughs> this child has ascites and hepatomegaly. Now, ascites hepatomegaly can be there with a liver disease primarily. In which case, I will expect hepatomegaly, ascites, and evidence of portal hypertension at this stage. Since there is no evidence of portal hypertension even at this stage, that means a significant liver disease doesn't exist. Therefore, primary liver disease is not present in this particular child, but a primary problem of this particular child is ascites, and the hepatomegaly is associated with. When primary problem is ascites and hepatomegaly is associated without a significant liver disease as reflected by absence of portal hypertension and any liver cell disease as reflected by absence of this symptom. So this is a case of primary ascites and in such a case with hepatomegaly and ascites it has to be post sinusoidal and therefore this is likely to be any of those. Things. Sir, only thing is when you say no portal hypertension we make it a little confusing because Actually, this is portal hypertension, but of the post-sinusoidal variety. That means clinically detectable. No, what I mean is, there could be in this particular child, portal hypertension. I felt the spleen was just palpable. But for this degree of liver cell disease advanced, to this extent, I would have expected a significant portal evidence of portal hypertension. Since there is no significant evidence of portal hypertension, with this degree of ascites, I think it is not a primary liver disease and the disease has primarily started with ascites. I think what Rajesh means is that portal hypertensions are pre-sinusoidal, sinusoidal and post-sinusoidal. So that's why he's saying that why say no portal hypertension? It's a post-sinusoidal portal hypertension. So it's a semantics more than anything. Fine. So I think this is what... Would you do a liver biopsy? No. No question. Okay, and how will you treat? Uh, hepatic venography with SOS uh, venoplasty. Fine. And therefore, today there is a possibility of opening up of these veins, okay, through an interventional radiological method. So, I think that would be the, the treatment. Yeah. You have done some investigations? Yes, sir. Yeah. Actually, patient had uh, come from uh, Uttar Pradesh, and uh, in Uttar Pradesh, they had already done um, a MRI venogram, and it had revealed uh, that uh, uh, findings are suggestive of chronic budgetary syndrome with complete occlusion of all the three native hepatic veins, as well as a two-centimeter long segment of intrahepatic IVC with in numerous intra and extrahepatic veno-veno collaterals. And changes of liver cirrhosis are seen with portal hypertension and moderate ascites. No arterial enhancing liver lesion is seen. And uh, sir, here uh, ogedoscopy was done. It revealed uh, esophageal varices and nodularity in antrum and duodenum. Uh, 
and uh, all uh, serum triglycerides and serum cholesterols were done triglyceride of 172 and cholesterol of 211 lfts uh, total bile of 0.6 total protein of 3.8 but albumin is 1.7 bun uh, and creat normal of 10 and 0.5 respectively and calcium of 7.1 pti in a normal and cbc platelet everything is normal we have the next case good evening uh, my patient aditya solanki a 2 year old male child second by birth order born of non consanguineous marriage resident of dharavi hailing from ahmedabad gujarat hindu by religion darji by community brought by and informed by father with chief complaints of fever since 4 days vomiting 2 uh, days prior to admission two episodes increased paleness since the last one month the fever was moderate grade not accompanied with chills non documented was initially mild to progress to become moderate grade for which medications were given and responded to the same it was intermittent in nature and the child was active in the interfebrile period there were two episodes of vomiting which were not accompanied with the fever episodes contained ingested food material the two episodes being separated by a period of one day the mother also complained of paleness of face which is present since the age of one year but has increased since the past one month over the past one month the child has also got decreased activity in form of decreased playing and in form of increased fatigability while playing these complaints have been uh, increased over the last 4 days uh, there is uh, no history of any uh, there is history of jaundice 2 months back for which he was shown to some temple priest who gave some powder and on taking that the jaundice slowly resolved according to the parents Uh, the child was uh, pale even during the period of jaundice there is no history of any bleeding from any side uh, no history of pica or passing worms in stools or vomitus uh, no history of arthritis arthralgia no history of uh, any uh, oliguria or dysentery no history of any similar complaints in the past uh, no history of any breathlessness or any uh, no history of any uh, abdominal distension abdominal pain or edema elsewhere in the body there is history of uh, cox in elder brother um, in form of uh, pleural effusion 3 years back for which uh, he has completed 3 months or 6 uh, months of akt for the same uh, no history of any drug intake by the child for any illness no history of any travel to endemic areas of malaria uh, history of two previous hospitalization one for acute gastroenteritis and the other for lower respiratory tract infection at the age of 3 months and 8 months of age respectively Uh, there is uh, no history of any blood transfusion in the past in the child or in the sibling or any other family member uh, presently the elder brother is suffering from chicken pox since past 5 days birth history wise uh, is a full term normal vaginal delivery the baby cried immediately after birth hospital delivery the child was kept in nicu for 2 days in view of low birth weight and since mother was uh, hyperthyroid for investigations uh, the mother is anc registered Uh, with protein in, uh, tetanus injection taken and supplements were taken the space between the two pregnancy was 4 years uh, there is no history of any fever with rash during pregnancy uh, no history of any neonatal jaundice and normal weight gain is seen in the um, post neonatal period the child is partly immunized uh, with dpt booster pending nutritional wise the child was breastfed only till the age of 1 and 1/2 months after which he was started on buffalo milk 1 is to 1 dilution by bottle feeding presently uh, in breakfast the child has half cup tea and 2 uh, to 3 biscuits in lunch he has half glass of milk half vati of rice uh, and dal and in the dinner he has only milk half glass and uh, half vati of rice and dal which uh, shows a deficit of approximately 1200 kilocalories and uh, 6 grams of protein 
developmentally the child is normal gross motor wise he can climb upstairs two feet on one step at a time fine motor wise he can feed with little spilling with spoon and can turn one page of a book at a time speech wise two word sentences are seen with meaning and social wise he can point to objects uh, when named family history um, father is 42 year old uh, has studied up to 8th standard he is in instrumental de instrument department in a private hospital earning 6500 per month mother is a 32 year old studied till 8th standard housewife both are having uh, second marriages um, the present marriage the elder uh, child is 6 year old and the younger child is 2 year old apart from the chicken pox in the elder sibling there is no other significant uh, medical history in either sibling uh, mother is hyperthyroid and she is on treatment for the same no history of any blood transfusion in any family member uh, socio economically uh, four members stay in the house in a two room house one floor above and up below uh, bathroom and toilet are separate and they fall under lower middle socio economic strata by the kopu swami classification so <clears throat> what are the presenting complaint fever fever and uh, increased paleness over the past one month okay so <clears throat> who wants to analyze that you know take up increased paleness because we are we need we have little time left so come to the paleness directly so increased paleness yeah tell us so mother is complaining that the child uh, is uh, uh, having such paleness since the age of 1 year but over the past one month this has increased and uh, both the parents feel that the child is more pale and this paleness has uh, been noticed furthermore over the past four days since the advent of fever since the onset of the fever so how do you analyze that <coughs> what is this paleness due to the one year paleness and then the present paleness so if we look into the dietary history it looks like a nutritional um, kind of an anemia which has been progressive over the past one month and there is a positive history of another illness like two months back there was some history of jaundice which was very vaguely given by the parents and after which the paleness has probably increased further and over the past four days since the onset of an acute illness it has been further precipitated for the anemia has been further precipitated So you think it's a primarily a deficiency anemia? Sir, on history, it uh, looks like a primarily deficiency. No, you never anemia. mentioned as to how long the child was bottled fed. You started said the child was started on bottle at one and a half okay, month, okay. and it was dilute and all. And then you never mentioned how long the child was bottled. Sir, till, till the age of uh, one year and three months, he was bottled fed. And of last nine months, the child is not being bottled. He is uh, from vati spoon and from the. And also comment that you said that the child is deficient by 1200 kilo calories. Deficient by 1200 kilo calories means hardly any intake only. You wanted to say the child's intake is 1200 calories, kilo calories. deficient then what's the requirement of a 2 year old child sir according to the rda according for his uh, age uh, it is uh, the median weight is uh, 12 kg and uh, the calculations comes out to 2400 my god no 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 he is getting if he is deficient in 1200 calories and if you fail that he required 2400 and he is getting 1200 he is getting what he wants is adequate for him at 12 and for a 2 year old child i think uh, nutritional anemia fine but you say it is aggravated now nutritional anemia never gets aggravated it's a chronic slowly progressive anemia how can a nutritional anemia would suddenly get worst that is not nutritional anemia isn't it does nutritional anemia gets worst over last 4 days why should it happen sir suddenly the nutritional deficiencies have increased sir not over four uh, over four days but maybe over two months or so because uh, patient had history of jaundice a similar patient we have one uh, in our ward who has hepatitis a uh, visible icterus jaundice and nutritional anemia on reports like hemoglobin of 5.2 and no, no, uh, i have no doubt it's nutritional anemia 
कैन न्यूट्रिशन लेनी मे गेट वर्स सडनली दैट्स माई क्वेश्चन नॉट सडनली बट नेवर नेवर हाउ कैन एन क्रॉनिक न्यूट्रिशन लेनी मे गेट सडनली डाउन बाय टू ग्राम्स नो इफ इट इज डाउन बाय टू ग्राम आईदर युअर लॅबोरेटरी इज रॉंग ओके और अर्लियर रिपोर्ट वॉज अ हिमो कॉन्सन्ट्रेशन एंड नाव यू हॅज गॉट रिअली अ रेट वॉट आय एम ट्राईंग टू से दॅट दिस इज नॉट अन एग्रेवेशन एट ऑल मे बी सर बिकॉज ऑफ हायपो प्रोटीनेमिया हायपो प्रोटीनमिया डझन कॉज एनिमिया वॉट इज प्रोटीन टू डू विथ एनिमिया नो नो नॉट एट ऑल बट इफ यू आर सो शुअर देन यू से दॅट ही इज ब्लीडिंग सडन ड्रॉप इन हिमोग्लोबिन इज ओनली टू थिंग हिमालिसिस और ब्लीडिंग इस शेड हॅज नो बिझनेस टू हॅव हिमालिसिस एज पर द हिस्ट्री सो इज ब्लीडिंग अनलेस यू से दॅट द रिसंट फेब्राईल इलनेस इज you know if you Leukemia. give details that it's like a yeah. malaria and yeah. hemolysis yeah. Yeah. and right. super added on the deficiency yeah. but so basic deficiency will not suddenly worsen and both of you are correlating the jaundice but jaundice what i mean what is the relationship of that jaundice to this anemia and what are the details of that jaundice you said it's a vague history yeah. at least high colored urine or no uh, nausea vomiting or no sir only uh, there was no history of any nausea vomiting given by the parents at that time only yellowing of eyes and thoda peela peeliya tha for which he was taken to a but what were the center. symptoms so they did not elab- they only said uh, at least the color of your maybe so they don't know so i would have called it a hemolytic jaundice okay that got better and he is getting getting pale again no he has another hemolysis he is xxx pd they are giving medication last time he had jaundice this time he has jaundice he is he is no jaundice but he has anemia he has a g6pd hemolysis is that a possibility yeah so what you would have debated is that this child has a compensated anemia he has no symptoms of anemia what are the symptoms of anemia one tiredness uh-huh. easy fatigue yeah easy fatigue or if it's a sudden anemia he may be in shock also He has neither of the two. What does it mean? It's a slowly progressive chronic anemia. Right? Sir, so over the did... past one month, he has a history of easy fatigability, decreased activity and decreased Fine. So, playing. So the point is that, again, if that is slowly coming, it's an aggravation of a deficiency. But point I'm making is that, if you want the jaundice to come in, I'll even push hemolysis, I'll put G6PD. So there are many. what what they're saying is that little more details if available you might say that i asked for a high colored urine but they don't know so that is what we are talk about so what is your impression on the history so uh, two year old uh, child uh, with history of a dietary deficiency with uh, progressive uh, anemia over the past one month with a history of jaundice two months back and a f- uh, acute history of uh, fever and vomiting um likely uh, nutritional anemia on history uh, to rule out hemolysis in view of the episode of jaundice and what about fever and vomit and an increased paleness so that is probably due to the hemolysis uh, the acute illness is again precipitated another episode of hemolysis no at one point as they progress even if it is nutritional some point the anemia is going to be such that the child becomes easily fatigable okay the hemoglobin drops at one particular point he is going to be easily fatigable and that may have happened a month back now often when the parents complain of pallor and jaundice you have to be little skeptical often a very pale child the parents may say that ye peela lagta hai and if he is only peela lagta hai and if he is taken to somebody and treated it it may not have been jaundice at all so it may have been all a story of slowly progressive anemia and now he is apparently in an any illness the child has easy fatigability is vomiting twice in acute febrile illness if the child's health is not good it is very much understandable and you do not have to entertain one more disease to explain that so so far it is easily compatible story of a slowly progressive anemia right from the age of 1 year in a largely bottle fed child he has been there after largely milk fed he is receiving some solids also which have not much of iron content and therefore this is this is 
and he was a small for the baby so he is again more prone for deficiency anemia because he is um, born with a smaller amount of iron stores so this is deficiency anemia and it can explain perhaps everything now if you say that this particular child did have an episode actually viral hepatitis at the age of 2 years is relatively uncommon ok it, if it occurs it is a mild disease but even then some constitutional symptoms with high colored urine etc etc was expected the recovery also would have been little more slow than what it occurred in this particular child but to entertain a hemolytic anemia in a child who has nutritional anemia and then he gets episodic jaundice and nutritional is difficult that means you are postulating to or you have to say that this particular child has only chronic hemolytic anemia or hemolytic anemia and deficiency anemia going together we would like to entertain only one diagnosis if everything fits in with nutritional anemia this is nutritional anemia okay let's examine quickly Do you expect normal weight and height? So tell us weight and height. Tell us liver and spleen. Liver and spleen can be palpable. If in case large, not large but palpable. Moderate. Yes. Why do you say that? Our diagnosis is a nutritional deficiency anemia. I am suspecting hemolytic as Oh, you are suspecting <laughs> all right. Okay. So if you are suspecting, that's all right. Are under but we ended up saying it's nutritional. Yeah. Okay. All right. And in nutritional anemia, we will not uh, expect, sir. Okay. And his weight and height, what do you expect? Uh, weight and height will be uh, normal for the normal? age. We are yes. saying about chronic nutritional problem. Because he is mi milk fed and that two bottle fed means uh, in such children, weight is usually normal, sir. Or they may be even obese. Obese, yes, sir. So you expect an obesity? Uh, at least normal. Uh, what you are saying is not totally wrong, but not not right in the present context. What you are saying is in a well hygienic families when lot of milk is given they may become a little normal in weight. Okay. Yeah. Alright. Come. Will you examine now? Come. I think you have been talking. Good. So come. Come quickly examine. No? We are short of time. So. Would somebody accompany him? Yeah. Very good. Come. First only inspection, huh? without touching him. Child is anxious. Sick looking. Why sick looking? He is not sick looking. No? He is quite okay. okay. Mm. Pale? Pale, yes. Mm. But not sick looking. Not sick looking. So, relevant examination, what do we want to say? On inspection, no. relevant general examination. I want to, to the case. Uh, I want to see for uh, other nutritional deficiencies as well, like okay. vitamin D deficiency. So talk of frontal bossing is visible. Uh, frontal bossing is seen. Then hair looks normal. There are no skin changes. Means no vitamin A deficiency features. Also, I would like to see for uh, wrists and. Uh, ankles to look for widening of the wrists. Mm. Also I would like to see for chest signs if any. Mm. I think first tell us whether he is malnourished. Yeah. Tell us oh, what yes, is his growth and nutrition first. Patient is undernourished. Okay. Yes. Why? Uh, oh, uh, I am not uh, looking at cheeks, uh, uh, I am looking at his uh, upper extremities and it looks like he is undernourished. I don't think he is uh, undernourished. So, so when you talk of growth, you first talk of appearance, height, 
whether he is very stunted in growth then you talk of weight then you talk of muscles muscle mass subcutaneous fat etc so in general what do you feel it's moderately built and moderately yeah, nourished so he is average i think he is not malnourished he is averagely nourished okay okay then relevant to this case would you want to look at hemolytic phases yeah. since you said i am considering hemolytic anemia yes sir i i would like to see for it but what do you think does he have a hemolytic phases no sir okay uh, i would like to see his teeth sir that that ho eager agar agar a do Hmm. what else relevant general examination quickly in a child with a young child who has come with anemia pelar i have to see so any dysmorphic features okay you could have a constitutional anemias which come so mention all that in general examination okay okay fine go on physically examine quickly बोला Did you get anything? Any okay. signs of rickets? No, sir. I could not find any signs of rickets, nor I could palpate his uh, liver or spleen. I thought iron deficiency and rickets go together. Yes. And he has no rickets. Uh, I could not find. How is that? Okay. Two things go together. so why is one missing so must not be deficient in him there no what do you think so my question is should he have rickets i first said that two things go together yes okay. and a prolonged bottle feeding sir in a um, uh, normally nourished child uh, uh, deficiency rickets is uh, in normally uh, nourished child deficiency rickets is there uh, Uh, because of uh, uh, increasing uh, nu- uh, nutritional needs so what you mean is in a well nourished child, child you will get rickets but if of late his nutrition has been just about average you may not get rickets okay what about his fontanel it is open so is that normal at this age he is 2 year old take the mic it is not normal sir. so he has a fairly large fontanel for a 2 year old and and he is short right 
Yeah, he's short, so he's yeah. hypothyroid. Cause of any man is hypothyroid. Short stature, wide open fontanel, and hypothyroids are anemia. You need thyroxine also for anemia, uh, for hemoglobin. So don't you think he is a hypothyroid? Why not? Short stage. There will be lethargy. Wide open fontanel. Or you want to say hydrocephalus? No, sir. Or then rickets. Only three causes, no? Rick. Then which one of the three? Rickets can fit in. Rickets. But we say no rickets. He's not growing. So can there be a fourth cause? That's what I'm asking. Hydrocephalus, hypothyroidism, rickets. Can there be a fourth cause? And that's the cause in this child. Vitamin C deficiency. Why should vitamin C lead to a large AF? What are the signs of vitamin C deficiency? Um, bleeding gums and killing. Oh, yeah. Cells. So, superior cell bleeding, pain, pain, but nothing like that. Pseudo paralysis, maybe, but no. So, what's the fourth cause of a delayed closure of fontana? Anything related to nutrition? So, undernutrition itself can be a cause, na? And then, when I said that he has a large AF, you, you should first look at the AF and then look at whether it's fully open or inner table is closed. All these things are important. So, while he has a large AF, his inner table is closed. Okay? So, these things are important. Now, uh, we'll look at his findings because there are findings in the abdomen. But when you said crying child, you can't. So, in exam, you are going to get crying child only of this age. So, you can't say because he's crying, I couldn't find. Which means you have to palpate more crying children. Please get into the wards and please palpate one-year-olds even when they are crying to learn how to palpate a crying child and how to auscultate a crying child. Now, tell us your findings. The child is conscious, active, alert, following simple commands, uh, afebrile with a heart rate of 114 per minute, respiratory rate of 36 per minute, peripheral pulses were well felt, pounding, CRT was less than 3 seconds, saturation was maintained at 94% on room A, blood pressure was 90 by 60. Uh, anthropometrically, the child um, weight, observed weight is 7.62 which is below the minus 3 standard deviation, the height is 73 centimeters which is again below the minus 3 standard deviation. Uh, weight for height is at minus 2 standard deviation. Head circumference is between minus 1 and minus 2 standard deviation. And the chest circumference is uh, same as head circumference is 46 cm. Mid upper arm circumference is 12.5 cm. The child fits into moderate acute malnutrition uh, according to the anthropometry. On head to toe examination, the skull shape and size appear normal. Uh, the AF inner table, anterior frontal and inner table is closed, outer is open 2, by, two centimeters by 1 centimeter. There is uh, evidence of frontoparietal bossing. Um, pallor is present, um, mild ectoris is seen, left eye mild swelling is present with of the upper eyelid with lacrimoria, hair is normal, uh, there is no evidence of any discharge from the ear, shape and size is normal, no dysmorphic or hemolytic facies, oral cavity is normal, there are 20 teeth um, dentition wise, uh, tongue papillae are normal, pallor is evident even on the tongue, no cyanosis, nails are normal, upper uh, limb bilateral wrist widening is seen. Cervical lymph node uh, non-significant, palpable on the left side. Chest wall, there is uh, pigeon chest. Uh, there is beading present. No scars or sinuses over the chest wall. Spine is of normal shape. Uh, multiple faintly hyperpigmented macules to patches are present over the skin. Um, there are hypopigmented macules over the upper limbs. Um, genitals are normal. Bilateral testes are palpable. There is no evidence of any limb edema. On systemic examination, abdominal inspection, there is mild uh, distension, upper abdomen more than the lower abdomen, uh, no evidence of any flank fullness, scars or sinuses or visible veins, umbilicus to zephyoid distance is more than umbilicus to pubic symphysis distance, the posterior abdominal wall is unremarkable. On palpation, uh, soft to palpate, on superficial palpation, there is no local rise of temperature, guarding or rigidity, no local tenderness. Abdominal girth is 44.5 cm at umbilical level. On deep palpation, liver is uh, non-palpable. Spleen is palpable 3 cm along the long axis, firm but non-tender, no skin changes above the palpable organ. 
uh, the child is not allowing percussion on auscultation uh, bubble sounds are heard uh, at this point i would like to palpate the father's spleen i palpated there was no spleen mother i did not palpate uh, cvs wise uh, uh, s1 s2 is normal there is a rest is all normal no yeah rest is all normal okay there is so a flow murmur on uh, auscultation so what's your summary and what's your probable diagnosis a 2 year male child partly immunized um, growth wise falling into moderate acute malnutrition um, with uh, no significant family history uh, with decreased dietary intake developmentally normal with anemia with mild dicteris with splenomegaly to rule out hemolytic anemia uh, secondly nutritional anemia and uh, uh, to rule out malaria chronic malaria why hemolytic anemia and which hemolytic anemia sir uh, he saying mild dicteris i didn't look for it sir uh, in view of one episode of uh, jaundice and uh, chronically uh, progressive pallor which is present and secondly the presence of spleen is uh, pointing towards uh, hemolytic anemia uh, so which hemolytic anemia are you thinking of it may be uh, either hereditary or any acquired hemolytic anemia at this age acquired hemolytic anemia is also a possibility and, and which hereditary uh, i look for hereditary serocytosis one um, apart from that g6pd deficiency can be a possibility um, then new uh, nutritional anemias uh, will be my second uh, differential and malaria will be the third uh, differential diagnosis okay go on how will you investigate nutritional anemia alone cannot be there in the presence of splenomegaly then you have to entertain some other diagnosis for splenomegaly 3 cm spleen and anemia is not nutritional anemia then you can say yes nutritional anemia and malaria or whatever you want to say that okay presence of the spleen only nutritional anemia cannot be there i think if you have a mild dicteris and spleen and that there is no question it's a hemolytic anemia and what kind of hemolytic anemia not transfusion dependent so that's important okay he has a malnutrition that's a different story that is another issue and therefore i would agree with him that the one possibility is a spherocytosis what history you would ask in a spherocytosis so moment you thought of spherocytosis there has to be something more to ask in the history what kind of history do you want in a spherocytosis spherocytosis is a dominant uh, disorder uh, so one parents. of the parents are likely to have spherocytosis so you must ask that how do you get a history of one of the parents having spherocytosis so are they stunted spherocytosis adults are stunted now just because this what it doesn't mean a spherocytosis but that means we go one step further to find out what it is so this child has got a nutritional deficiency not nutritional deficiency anemia necessarily but he has a nutritional deficiency he has a calorie protein deficiency and he has got a hemolytic anemia likely to be a hereditary spherocytosis if you just talk about three types of hemolytic anemias clinically sickle is one thalassemia is another and spherocytosis the third acquired is unlikely because acquired are generally not chronic acquired are generally acute so this is a chronic anemia so we will not bring in an acquired at all besides that he has a malnutrition but he has signs of rickets and you said that uh, rickets occurs in a well growing child so why is this is it a resistant rickets no the point is that this child was growing well in the first few months at which time he developed rickets and thereafter he stopped growing so today you are seeing a malnourished child who was once upon a time growing well and therefore at that time developed rickets those signs don't disappear those signs take a long time to disappear even after treatment the signs take few months to disappear here is a child who may not have been treated but who stopped growing when he stopped growing the rickets stop growing and the rickets became almost as if they are not active so this child has beating of ribs he said epiphyseal enlargement it doesn't mean so how do you 
put one more finding on examination. Is it active rickets or old rickets? So what are the signs of active rickets? One is increasing deformities. Increasing deformities is an active rickets. At this age, if he had an active rickets, he would have had active display. Is he a walking child? Then he would have had much more signs in the lower limbs as well. So I think this is the way you would go by. I would say that this child has got a chronic calorie protein malnutrition with an evidence of old rickets, which is not active now. So I'm not going to think about renal rickets or vitamin D resistant rickets, which would have gone on worsening with deformities worsening. You may also talk about active rickets in terms of craniotabies, which is not an easy sign to go. You can also go further one bit and say that, does he have any signs of an occult subclinical hypocalcemia, which means a trosses sign, the chest talk sign. They are difficult, but to mention, to say, I would try to pick up any. Suppose he has a signs of a subclinical hypocalcemia, then he is very much an active rickets. So I think this is the way you would go by that. Right? What you meant was that if he has no deformity, he has no progressive rickets. He could have deficiency rickets then and now they are not healed. That means the rickets, vitamin D, yeah, vitamin D may be still low. They are not progressive rickets. That will give rise to deformity. You have investigated him. Just tell us the salient positive investigations. So there is a question that why are we not entertaining leukemia at all in this child? <laughs> no, no, I think first thing is that this is a chronic anemia. Leukemia is an acute process. Second is he is not sick. Third thing is that he doesn't have any other signs of leukemia like purpuric spots, okay, irritability, bony tenderness, fever, etc. History also you would have. That's why they were asking, give us more details about fever, vomiting. What Dr. Kare said, fever, vomiting is just an accidental some infection. Don't bring in all that. That's why probably not leukemia. Yeah? Just tell us whether he has what kind of anemia. That's our interest. Rest of it may not be of importance. Yeah? So, um on admission, the child had a hemoglobin of 3.7, um, total counts of 6,900. Uh, the MCV was 58.9 with an MCH of 12.4, uh, MCHC of 21, uh, with RDW increased at 23.6. Uh, platelets were normal, 2,40,000. The ESR was 30. Uh, the child was uh, transfused on that. Uh, and prior to the transfusion... Tell us what anemia this child is. It's so the peripheral smear is suggestive of a hypo micro picture uh, with occasional teardrop uh, cells and uh, platelets in clumps. Microspherocyte seen? No, sir, not seen. Uh, sir, the iron studies were done on this child and uh, uh, this suggestive of uh, an iron deficiency type of anemia. What they about bilirubin? So, bilirubin, total bilirubin was 1.2, uh, direct bilirubin was 0.2, liver enzymes were normal, AST. So, there thyroid. was no icterus. So, can you have an icterus with a normal bilirubin? Say yes. Can you have an icterus with a normal bilirubin? Icterus will take time to disappear, bilirubin will come down. So, you can still argue, this is not, I am sure there was no icterus. That's why doctor... Sokani said he did not see the eyes, he said icterus. We called it hemolytic. Otherwise, we will call it malaria like, etc. The point is that just make a note of that. Okay, bilirubin falls down first, the icterus takes time to go down. So, if you saw an icterus with normal bilirubin, you can still argue to say he must have been yesterday bilirubin high, today is slow. Yeah. Why does that happen? Yeah. In fact, bilirubin is the cause of icterus, no? Bilirubin comes down, icterus doesn't. That's what he's asking. Why does that happen? It's Don't believe in what we say. Okay, argue. You say, why did you say that? Yeah. So the serum levels will disappear first. The deposition in the tissues will take time. So the pigment deposition of a tissue takes time to disappear. Blood levels come down. Okay. So the renal function tests are normal. Uh, 10 and 0.8 of one and create. Sodium, potassium are normal. Uh, so tell us cause of splenomegaly in this child. That's it. Our interest is that. Now we know that there was no icterus. 
If you said ictarus, then we said hemolytic, spleen. Okay. Now in iron deficiency, you have a spleen. Sir, in 10 to 15% cases, it's given that some cases have been seen. <laughs> we had associated B12 and megaloblastic and some palpable speed. But 3 centimeters should normally go against the teaching of an nutritional anemia. Then you look out for something else. Don't say that after 2 years he's going to have hematomasis and he had extra apatic port lab patient within whatever that is. But today you can't take it. Uh, sir, we have sent an HPLC of the child. Um, probable thal intermedia may come at the age of two years. So, we have sent an HPLC of the child as well. The report is awaited. Okay. Mother is Gujarati, father is Maharashtra. Hmm? Pardon? Reticulocyte count? Sir, retic count is 2.2. The sickling is negative. Corrected retic. Sir, approximately one. How did you correct it? Sir, hematocrit by 45 into the retic count. Two. Hematocrit by 45 into the retic count. Yeah, so but they have not been able to prove malaria, but and that's a yeah possibility nutritional anemia with malaria currently is a possibility malaria and he had area. fever sir now now no two, two days four days four days fever sir the malarial antigen test was negative and the peripheral smear was also negative for malaria uh, tuberculosis workup was done in view of the elder sibling having uh, a cox history it was also coming out to be negative elder so maybe XYZ has given to older child and the same individual contact or some other contact in the family may give to this. But that plural effusion will not give tuberculosis to this child. Third source can give to both the children. Anyway, you presented very well, doctor. And details were very good. Lambe res ka ghoda hai. With this, we come uh, to the end of today's telecast. We thank Alembic for their wholehearted support for this program. For the month of April, we will not be having any telecast. And uh, the date and place of the next telecast in May will be announced later. Thank you.